What's going on guys? Today we're going to do a full technical breakdown on the Gamma Base engines. And we'll be covering a comparison between Point Eclipse's Gamma engine versus Amp TM40 engines by Smart Parts and DLX. First, to make it easy, we'll go over an explanation of the Gamma Base engines utilizing Pointit's provided animation, which can be found on their Point Eclipse TV's YouTube channel. A small amount of background, the first Gamma Core engine was first seen in the original G-Tech, which was released in 2015 an affordable mid-tier platform that touted incredible reliability with high-end performance. Those characteristics cannot be stressed enough here. Here we see features found from their flagship Ivy Core and a clear foundational jumping point from their Ether One. I'm going to preface and say that the AMP and Team 40 are closer to the Gamma Pro than to the standard Gamma, but let's see where it started first and what makes the GP slightly different. Here we have an animation of the OG G-Tech. Air from the bottle travels through the ASA to the high pressure regulator located in the front grip via a macro line. Air from the bottle is down pressure to the approximate 135 PSI operating pressure. Now again, operating pressure is a product of the amount of volume in the air chamber. So let's look at the marker at rest. Regulated air travels down the body towards a solenoid and as you can see here, it is directly connected to the fire air chamber. So this means that supply is constant and is not regulated by the solenoid, which is consistent with the ether, but different compared to the IV core. For example, the CS1 solenoid controls the supply to the fire air chamber and cuts it off during the firing cycle. How it's been improved upon compared to the ether is the rear switch controls the supply. At rest, the fire air chamber is filled and is creating an air spring acting on the bolt pushing it rearward. Again, compare that to the physical spring the ETHA has constantly pushing the bolt back. The regulated air from the HBR diverted to the solenoid fills the rear switch air chamber, which is in my opinion the magic of the Gamma Core. This chamber is creating a bias pushing the switch and spool shaft forward. Note the seal that is containing the fire air chamber air from exiting the valve. This is also where we see the jump from the ETHA to the Gamma. The switch and the spool shaft are separate, whereas the ether uses a single shaft. Now back to the magic of the gamma core. The trigger is pulled, activating the micro switch, energizing the pile valve. The spool or switch on the solenoid shifts rearward. Supply to the rear switch air chamber is cut off and is now venting out of the manifold. Which you can see here. The lack of pressure from the rear switch air chamber flips the bias and now the rear switch and shaft are now pushed rearward. That allows the fire air chamber to start venting at the valve. The engine has a very high shifting force, which keeps it from having issues with bolt stick. Now, to combat a very high heavy force from acting too quickly on the bolt, Planet has a two-stage bolt acceleration. The first stage is here. The fire air chamber continues to push the bolt forward, passing the first O13 seal. This is where the second stage begins. Once the end of the bolt passes the last O13 seal on the tip of the valve, the fire chamber air is able to vent through the face of the bolt. At this point, the bolt has sealed off the breech and is able to release the air pulse, pushing the ball out of the marker. This pulse creates back pressure, similar to the Ivy Core's breech sensing valve. Air travels down the inner diameter of the spool shaft exiting at the tail. This pulse, plus the compression from the spring, pushes the spool forward off of the switch sealing the supply to the fire air chamber while also sealing it at the valve, allowing it to capture over 30 PSI of air. That may normally be wasted. Now, this is absolutely crucial. If the air chamber were dumped, there would be no air spring to reset the bolt. Now that the fire air chamber is sealed, the air spring is able to act at, on the sail and push the bolt back into its rearward resting position. This is important as this illustrates the gamma's dwell in sensitivity. The bolt was able to return independently from what the solenoid is doing. This is why the Gamma makes for such an excellent mechanical platform. No real short stroking or continuous venting to be concerned with, as it's self-timed. The dwell is reached, the solenoid returns supply to the rear switch chamber, resetting the switch to its resting position. Supply to the fire air chamber has returned and the marker is ready to fire again. There are so many awesome details to appreciate with the Gamma Core, which makes it such a fantastic system relying on a very unique sequence of actions and reactions which were not found in paintball before. Now, let's talk about the CS2. Aside from the changes to the air routing due to the location of the HPR being in the ASA, the GP and the Gamma are fairly similar. 
Where they differ, the GB core has a larger air chamber, runs at approximately 105 PSI. The valve at the shaft is a poppet seal versus a spool seal. Now, why would they do that? A poppet valve is a more efficient valve, meaning it allows for more airflow. It's more sensitive, faster acting. Now, I don't know if it's completely necessary, but if it does help to improve flow, which may be beneficial when dealing with less pressure, we'll see that the AMP and the TM40 have copied this as well. The valve nose is elongated, and I assume to regularize the turbulence of air exiting the valve. Lastly, the spring in the GP core is a little more taut than the spring found in the Gamma, which allows for the breach sensing to be a little more sensitive and quicker responding. Now, I probably should have split the video up at this point, but let's just jump into the AMP core. What I'm about to say applies to the TM40 as well, so keep that in mind. Since we just went over the Gamma with that animation in such detail, I will not be diagramming the AMP to the same level I did with the Dai FL21 engine, but I will be covering the routing and where they slightly veered from the Gamma. Bottled air travels through the ASA up the frame through the transfer to the body towards the HPR. Regulated air at approximately 110 PSI leaves the HPR and down the air transfer pipe, identically to the Gamma. The air diverts to the fire air chamber and to the solenoid. Again, the solenoid controls the supply to the rear switch air chamber. Where DLX and SP change their approach is how the AMP and the TM40 vent that rear switch air chamber. In smart parts fashion, they ended up implementing a quick exhaust valve, or a QEV, which uses this directional diaphragm. At rest, the rear air chamber supply pushes the diaphragm, sealing it against the port. A larger area on the supply side versus rear switch air chamber creates a bias. Once the trigger is pulled, a pilot is energized. Switch in the spool shifts, supply to the rear switch air chamber is cut off, and the remaining air in the channel is vented through the solenoid. Now where it changes with the QEV, the rear switch chamber air inflates the diaphragm, opening up the port, allowing the air to vent. As I mentioned in my initial review of the amp, uh, I still don't understand quite the benefits of adding complexity to the system with this QEV. When the solenoid is already performing the same action as the gamma, you have a consumable part with this diaphragm, where if it tears or if there's a small seal that begins to leak, the marker is going to be unstable and attempt to fire. I've talked to, uh, to a subscriber whose marker would fire when aired up and it constantly sputtered. The problem was a result of the QV not sealing properly. I'm just not convinced it's entirely necessary. After the KEV, the AMP and the Team 40 are functionally identical to the Gamma Pro, and I can't stress that enough, they function identically. It's not a question of two spools which happen to have a breach sensing valve, an air spring, and a decoupled spool. The DLX and SP engines follow the exact sequencing as the Gamma. But I digress. Getting back on track again, they both have the poppet seals at the valve. Comparatively to the GP, they have a poorly designed two-stage bolt acceleration due to how close the stages are to each other and the larger orifice at stage one. DLX and SP have a 1.5 millimeter diameter orifice versus the one millimeter diameter orifice on the GP. The larger the orifice, the higher the flow and the more air that is acting on the sail in a given amount of time, meaning faster acceleration. This coupled with their open face bolt, you have some potential for really poor paint handling because the open face bolt allows for rollback. If you guys recall the o-ring change to the amp where they have owners replace the bumper o-ring on the bolt for the larger seal found on the sail, going from, I believe, a 013 bumper to a 016. This larger o-ring is to create drag, slowing down the bolt speed to be more gentle. Now, I've harped on the amp in the past, but I just don't know how a company that has copied the Gamma with three separate iterations of the bolt can't get some of these details right. I do want to acknowledge that DLX SP have made changes to the platform that do differentiate it from PE. Uh, I feel their shot characteristics are noticeably different from PE, and it could be argued that they are more efficient. Now, is that a result of the QEV or faster bolt speed? Possibly. And is that a trade-off for paint handling, a worthwhile improvement? I don't know, but that's certainly up to the user to decide. 
This next part is a bit of a rant, and I want to touch on the reoccurring topic that seems to come up every few months about the drama between these engines. At this point, and I like I said, it's common knowledge that Planet was copied. It's old news at this point. But there's a lot of misinformation and completely irrelevant banter that shows its nasty little face during these debates, which I'm going to attempt to address, which probably isn't the greatest idea. Firstly, Point Eclipse did not file for a patent for the Gamma Core. Planet has publicly come out and said they chose not to file a patent, nor would they have gone through and added the financial burden of fighting infringements on their design. We're talking about paintball, a very, very small niche industry. We aren't talking about a multi-billion dollar company that has the money to throw at attorneys to fight it out with another company. It's just not financially feasible. And more importantly, it would just place a black eye on their reputation. Just look at smart parts and how many small companies they went after ensued. Their actions, for all we know, really changed the landscape of paintball and how we know it now. And by many, they are still viewed poorly by those actions, which is why all of this is ironic. It wasn't a couldn't, it was they didn't file a patent. Was Jack the only person involved with, with the development of the Gamma? Absolutely not. Some of the great minds in paintball helped influence this platform. Fortunately, these friendly relationships allow for growth in the industry. But at the end of the day, Planet owned the Gamma. There wasn't another party preventing them from filing. It was their choice. And I touch on this because there was misinformation spread about another party owning the design. I've heard people talk about, well, maybe Bob Long should have sued Planet for their ego years ago and their poppet valves. And I say, why is that relevant? The poppet valve existed far before paintball. The poppet valve's application in paintball existed before it was really paintball. Well, then Jack should be sued for electronically controlled pneumatic markers. Okay, but Jack was part of arguably the first electronically controlled pneumatic markers from WDDP. So now what? These types of comments are just not relevant. We are beyond spool valves just being spool valves, knock open poppets just being knock open poppets. Engin engines are becoming far more sophisticated. Things aren't patented for what they are, but for how uniquely they function. And if you want more information regarding this topic, go check out the Madman's channel as <laughs> He uh, also gladly covered it as well. So where do we go from here? Do we just move on? Do we let it go? Should we care? And the answer is absolutely yes, but we shouldn't let it go lightly as moves like this hurt the industry as a whole. When you have, in my opinion, two of the top manufacturers using the same platform, following the same roadmap, we are left in a state of limbo. There's a lack of innovation and competition, and that creates a stagnant environment. And that's where we've been the past couple years. And that's not to say there hasn't been innovation, but there has been without a doubt, a noticeable drop. And I say that, and I wanna highlight that there has been some innovation coming out, uh, especially within the mech realm. And then the non gamma based engines Mar uh, or markers have resulted in some very complex switches. I have a MacDev XDR here uh, provided by someone from the community. That's that mech switch is based off of J4's design patent uh, with their pulse valve. Super cool stuff, really innovative. And yeah, of course you can expect a technical breakdown from me, kind of going over it, kind of highlighting and appreciating the design of it and we have designers like john chambers who are the lead designer at Dai, uh pushing out some really awesome great markers and i know we can definitely be uh excited for some of the stuff that is coming from them but we need more of that the most anticipated markers are from field one with the predecessor of the g6r uh the lv2 the cyborg 7 from active hopefully but they're stack two poppets. And that's not to say that there won't be innovation, but the ceiling is kind of low for that. And really these releases are just gonna be scratching the itch that the community has been asking for. Uh, really just bringing these markers into this current decade. Um, I mean, 
it's just they're more of a need of a refresh. It, it won't be like a huge technological technological leap um, in the stack two market or the stack two platform. And if you follow the trends, the popularity has really jumped over the past few years, uh, which is kind of interesting. And it's not to say that there's, there's a direct connection to it, but it almost seems like when there's a lack of interest coming from one side of the market, uh, interest on in another form starts kind of butting its head, like the interest in stack tubes. I mean, they definitely were at a low valley a few years ago, and then all of a sudden interest started peaking. And in a way, you can kind of see how that sort of aligns when the Lux X came out. And it's like, oh, I guess nothing new is coming out or there's nothing new or exciting coming out. It's kind of like the release of uh, the 2022 WRX. It looks like the same thing or it has the same power numbers, slightly updated engine, really ugly styling, but that really drove uh, the market on the previous generation. Like people bought them up once they realized that nothing really new or exciting was coming out for it people changed their interests people were i'm sure were holding out for the new 2022 as soon as it was announced they're like nope <laughs> i don't care anymore so it's just interesting seeing that within paintball now and i think you can make an argument that that was the case uh with the release of the x and now of course we see it with the amp and the tm40 so that's where I'm going to leave my little rant. Uh, <laughs> I know it's kind of, it took a different direction there, but I, I hope you guys found the technical aspect of the video helpful. Uh, and if you guys have any questions, leave them down below and uh, I'll see you guys in the next video. Thanks for watching guys and quit talking paintball.